Well, hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome back to another episode of Ginger Arky. I am your host, Trisha Stewart Mann, FBI CIA plants, and I moonlight as a ginger monarchist in the evening. Today, I have um, somebody you guys, <laughs> that's not, none of that's true. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just say something ridiculous every time I introduce myself. Sure. <laughs> I have somebody who a lot of you know, he's one of my favorite modern libertarians, um, a great speaker. You probably know him as the vice presidential candidate for the libertarian uh, ticket in 2020. I have Spike Cohen on today. Hello, Spike. Welcome. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you for having me on. I, this is I'm really look, been looking forward to this because when you and Chris Spangle came came to see me in uh, in Ohio at the <laughs> Waffle House, uh, I got to talk to you for like three minutes, and then I went and started taking you know, doing autographs and selfies and all that. And then I'm like, where's Trisha? And I guess you had to leave or whatever. Chris was still there, but. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's got a good, he really gets around, you know. He gets around a lot, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then he insists it's not him, but that was definitely Chris right. Bangle. But that's part of his okay. shtick. I don't know. It's totally him. Like, no, Which, I'm by a the way, in uh, Cleveland. No, you're not. If you don't know Chris Bangle, he actually is the founder of our network, which I'm on. We are Libertarians yes. Network. Awesome. Tons of shows. Great product. But Chris just recently got engaged yesterday. I so I do want to give a shout out to him and Reagan. Congratulations, you guys. That's Congratulations, awesome. Reagan. You have snagged yourself an amazing man. Yes. And uh, I don't know Reagan that well, so I can only assume that I'm congratulating Chris as well. I, get, I, I assume Reagan is, is as great She's as She's a lovely, smart, go-getter, libertarian gal. So, yeah. yes. Good. It, well, then which I, is congratulations. Proof if, you, if you slide into somebody's DMs long enough, fellas, never mind. That's probably not true. Chris Spangle is living proof. Yeah. Who, well, first of all, who am I to say? I am Chris Spangle and I are two. I refuse to call us outliers, but we are living proof that if you stay in the DMs respectfully, yes, respectfully, that's a key part of it, you will win. I don't know that you'll win, but you might win. You miss 100%. We are proof that you miss 100% of the shots that you do not take. I, I think there's a Facebook group <laughs> that shows that you That's, guys aren't necessarily yeah. the outliers. There is a weird phenomenon. I don't know why I got invited to this group. So there's a group called um, Libertarian Guys with Disproportionately Attractive Spouses or something like that. Wives. Which is <laughs> wives. And uh, and I, I don't like it because I'm very, very attractive. Like really, I'm like really, really attractive. But and if I don't you could like take the, like Tasha and then compare her to most guys. <laughs> you know I mean, what I mean? I'm, I'm not I'm not attracted to guys, so I'm the wrong one to ask. <laughs> All I'm telling you is I look in the mirror and am overwhelmed. I, I get it. I get what how she feels, right? Right. So when she looks at me, I get what that must be like. Do you let her know this? this? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. We have this conversation a lot. I talk to her about my overwhelming, like, visceral masculinity, and she responds as one would expect. <laughs> Which your wife is very lovely, by the way. Yes, she is. She is. Um, actually, my husband even though it was on a dating site, did slide into my messages, which I rarely responded to them, didn't really take it seriously. And he did uh, quote Ayn Rand. And I didn't put that I was oh. a libertarian. I think he caught some clues from what I said. So now we're married. Smart guy. Listen, smart guy. Yeah. Context clues, mm -hmm. gentlemen. Unless she specifically says, I want to see weird pictures of you. Don't start with that. Now, if she says that, there's your opening for that. But if, if she not, says that, she might also want to charge you later. That's also true. <laughs> you, this might be a different relationship you're getting into, which again, this is on that's between you guys. But if if you can pick up the context clues and you think, hey, I might be able to quote an objectivist, this could work. This could work. It does. Um. And, you know, I don't know. I, I like the strange, but I'm also a libertarian. So maybe this doesn't work for, you know, statist women or something. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so that's a, so we could potentially be like setting people up for like calls from. Yeah. yeah. Just again, respectfully. Yes. <laughs> Respect, 
respectfully and consent is key you you slide in their dms and they say no thank you that is not an invitation to continue that, or that to means... waive every three months yeah that's weird it's really weird sometimes i think they just delete conversations and then forget and go back because i but i kind of oh. just leave them open like on read because i think i want to see how committed this person is to waving at me for like three how years. many times are you gonna like yeah. and especially if you picture it like if it were in person and they go by and they're like <laughs> but they keep doing that and you just look at them and then they come back and they're like or like send a, a gif with like a bouquet of flowers thank you for saying gif oh i am i am about ready to declare war on the gif people like it's it's well you know the guy that came up with it that what is, is it? wrong Gra is wrong is wrong is wrong yes i know that the man who came up with the graphics <laughs> interchange format you don't like graphics. the gifies on the webs I know that he's wrong. <laughs> yes, thank you. I do know because it's graphic, not graphic. Right. You know, I actually I knew this whole you know the joke about how he said it was actually, but that actually does make sense if you think about it. He's wrong. Yeah. He, you know, he's he. You know, people fade over time, right? Like he started strong with the GIF, and then you know he gets you know he's a little more seasoned, a little bit up in the years. He goes, I think it's pronounced GIF. No. No, it's not. It's pronounced GIF. That it's could have been graphics. like, maybe he did that to kind of gain some steam and, you know, it was a controversy that he made up, you know? Oh, much, like he was trying to get, he's trying to get canceled by the left so we could get a show on Daily Signal or something or? Much like your Wikipedia page. Oh God. Like, Can we talk about my Wikipedia page for a second, please? So I'm going down to look through to find a nice bio on you. And I like to kind of craft one out of everything I see. Yeah, so obviously, yeah. you know, you go to Wikipedia, you, mm -hmm. I think you have an Indeed, um, which, I, you know, you get to have fun there yourself, um, which I enjoy. I have an some, Indeed? It, it was it not, not, not Indeed. I'm sorry. Um, gosh, I'm losing my brain. You know oh, where LinkedIn. you network and connect? Yes. Oh, okay. I was just having an Indeed. Yeah. Well, that would be cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hire Spike Cohen to come speak at your next. I have indeed on my brain. My daughter's looking for a new part-time employment this summer. So oh, I've been scrolling oh, through oh. there. But um, no. so on your Wikipedia page, lovely. Yes. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm just going to open this up. This is the part I enjoy the most, mm. which the photo's lovely. <laughs> Cohen, an ally of performance artist and perennial candidate, <laughs> Vermin Supreme, who I love Vermin. Mm -hmm. Ran yes. during his vice presidential primary campaign on a platform mm. promoting free ponies, mandatory toothbrushing, mm. zombie power, killing baby Hitler and baby Woodrow Wilson, Wilson, and promoting anarchy. Okay, so two of those are true. Vermin Supreme ran on toothbrushing, free ponies zombie power and killing baby hitler the only thing i promised was killing baby woodrow wilson and promoting anarchy every everything else on there is a blasted lie i did say vermin was going to do that i never promised to do that so that's the first lie um also what i love is that if anyone thanks to wikipedia being the prime source of information about human beings uh that is uh, sourced by google when someone googles spike cohen the first thing they see is, where is it? Oh, see, look, I got all fancy. First thing they see is this. Now, look. Oh, I I'm didn't not, know you did a little guest spot on uh, the Big Bang Theory. That's pretty cool, yes. Spike. <laughs> so this is, now I'm told this picture is not as bad as it has turned into, because this is now a jabberwocky in my head. The fact that this is what people see. Like, I realize it's not, terrible but there are so many good pictures of me out there like we've hired uh, we actually have like ovens o'brien has taken multiple photo shoots of me there are all these great photos of me and the first thing that people see when they look my name up is this when was that taken this was taken last october in uh, uh tempe arizona i did not want to wear that shirt or that tie <laughs> It was 120 degrees outside. I was dead inside in this photo. I was in my probably second hour of Q&A, standing in front of a bust exhaust fan. 
for the generator system for the 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 um the the audio system we had the speakers and all that stuff and i'm done in this photo i am done my hair is done every part of me is finished in this photo and yet i'm still soldiering through answering questions with the best smile i can manage to put on my face in that moment and this is what everyone looks at i look like i'm really excited to speak at my dad's christmas party like like <laughs> Or like the National Honor Society breakfast or something like that. Yes. I'd like to thank the Rotary Club for having me to speak about my summer lawn mowing initiative. Like it's, <laughs> it's this, yeah. yes. Well, I, I think that, you know, in order to get your Wikipedia um, updated and a little more fair and flattering and understanding yes. of who you actually are, we could just call on people, call on the listeners. Yes. Let's do that. Do that please. I think one of them would be fantastic. Uh, she's a fellow Ohioan to me. I think I think Chrissy Wickers would just. Oh no. She would light that thing up. <laughs> I, I'm I am not certain that Chrissy Wickers could make that worse. Probably not. Actually, she's going to be like. And those are probably famous last words. Those are probably famous last words. But I don't think she could make it worse. But if anyone would like to help who isn't Chrissy Wickers. You're also welcome to try. We have actually, I mean, I have a volunteer team that has been trying to help with this, like change some of the information on there, update the information, change this terrible picture out with something better. And there's one Wikipedia user that uses every single procedural thing to either delay or end any kind of changes to the Wikipedia. And I don't know if it's because they really, they don't like me or because they really, really, maybe they really like me and this is what they want. This is what they, like, this is what's on their shrine at home is this picture of me. I think that's probably it, yeah. Whatever it is, yeah, whichever it is, we need to help. We need help <laughs> to, to get that to get that changed because I would love for that Wikipedia to be a little bit not terrible. Like we even give, you know, I, I'm speaking at different events every single week and I'm doing uh, all these, you know, interviews and appearances on people's shows. And so we give, a, usually give a bio and especially for the events, we'll give a bio and a, uh, and a headshot. And then without fail, they will go to Google and they'll use this picture and say that I'm going to kill baby Woodrow Wilson. I remember yeah. years ago in the libertarian uh, world of social media, where people mm -hmm. were talking like about killing baby Hitler and then it became yeah. a debate idea mm -hmm. and then it became, which is all fun, fun and games and the circles. But if you're outside looking in, you probably think we're insane. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Well, especially when I show up and I'm the actual former VP candidate for the third largest political party in this country. And I'm routinely telling people, guys, this is ridiculous. If we just killed Woodrow Wilson, there'd be no Hitler. I mean, he'd probably still be a person. Right. He'd just be an artist. He'd just be some like kind of mediocre artist. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he'd have been good. You know what? Maybe if he hadn't, you know, wasted his time fighting in World War One, maybe he would have been good. This is true. Maybe he would have oh. sold us paintings and fallen in love with a woman who was about liberty and changed his mind on ideas and settled down with a nice jewish girl he's a good yeah. artist like yeah. imagine a world where like hitler is known as this like fairly good to middling artist from germany who did great landscapes that's gonna get quoted I, with, my face, with, with this with this face next to it <laughs> it's every time every time you put it up like i imagine you going uh. <laughs> yeah no this is my life this is my life. I wake up and people are like, I know you. And I know what they mean when they say that. I can tell from how people react to me, whether this is what's in their head or not. <laughs> so yes, that's going to be the next meme is this picture. Imagine a world where Hitler was just a good artist with a Jewish wife. Like this is how this is already on that, to be honest. That's good. Someone yeah. should be. I want it to be someone close to me if it's going to be anyone. <laughs> So your, your real bio, um, I know that you started in web design. You had a firm in yes. web design. 
Um, and then obviously you were the vice presidential candidate on the ticket in 2020. And then you yes. also have Muddied Water Media, Muddied mm -hmm. Waters Media. Um, yes. And what exactly, I know what you do there, but tell tell everybody listening what, what Muddied Water Media is. It's a super I know what it is, but just tell everyone else what it is. No. So uh, <laughs> Muddy Waters Media is uh, it's kind of similar to We Are Libertarians, except we don't have as many people as you guys do yet. Uh, but we uh, um, Muddy Waters Media was actually started by a guy named uh, two guys named Matt Wright and Mohammed Shaker, both in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Um, they brought me on in 2018. Uh, and I started by doing a show called My Fellow Americans, which I do every uh, Wednesday. Usually uh, I do it live at 8 p.m. Eastern. And I have, uh, sometimes I do Q and A's on there uh, where it's just me, but sometimes I, most of the time I have guests on there, um, all sorts of different guests. So like, for example, my next guest uh, is a lady named Alex who is starting a, a new app, a libertarian based app for, it's like an Uber for, um, uh, 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 hairstylists and estheticians uh, called Mantafly, and she's going to use the money from that to build a voluntarist mutual aid thing. Uh, I speak with uh, professors, I speak with uh, politicians, I speak with activists, I speak with attorneys, uh, I speak with just all sorts of interesting people. I try to find people out just outside of libertarian circles, not always, but I try to find people that aren't just the same like libertarians being interviewed over and over again um, and, and try to like get a bunch of different sort of either outside or just outside of our circles perspectives about things. Um, and then I also on Tuesdays, um, I do the Muddy Waters of Freedom where Matt Wright and I talk about the week's events. Um, and it's sort of like the daily show, except even more sarcastic uh, and, and from a libertarian uh, anarcho-capitalist standpoint. Um, so if you were, if that's what you were dreaming of, the anarcho, the ANCAP, the really, really, the really, really sarcastic ANCAP version of of uh, of the Daily Show. Then I have great news for you. Uh, Tuesdays at eight, um, and then we're actually starting. We got a new show on Money Waters Media uh, starting on Sundays at three. The Eskimo Libertarian and the Cajun Libertarian are teaming up to do a show called Cajun and Eskimo from the Bayou to the igloo or something like that that is so specific <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that that phrase has ever been said before from the bayou uh, to the igloo <laughs> i hope not i hope we can patent that that's i'm a little bit familiar with the cajun libertarian so that's pretty cool i'll have to check that out um and i like fun shows and interesting shows um and there's mm -hmm. merit to you know the the stuffy podcasts and things like that but i enjoy feeling like I'm having a conversation with somebody too. You know, I, I want to finish the podcast instead of thinking, when is this over and clicking it off? So, right. And that's the thing. I want it to be fun. I want people to have fun. Like even when I do these types of interviews, I try to be as conversational and fun as, as a lot, as time allows and the subject allows. Obviously if we're talking about something extremely heavy, I'm not going to be like, you know, funny about it. But I think that it, if you lose people, if you've got a, you know, hour long plus program, and you're not engaging them in some way where they feel entertained and feel like they're enjoying, you're going to lose them. Like most people aren't wired to watch an hour of a very, very serious discussion about something, not on a regular basis anyway. Right. You got to entertain people. You got people have to enjoy that they're watching this. I think um, I, you know, obviously think a lot about podcasting because it's something I do. But I think part of uh, what Michael Malice does, love him or hate him, I think he's very entertaining. He's funny and he brings on different. And so um, I, I don't think right. I've ever listened to an episode of his where I, where I didn't finish it, which I can't say for everybody. So right. Right. Yeah, definitely on the same page there. So I'm glad you say openly you're an anarchist because I am as well. And I refuse to drop that label and let it be owned by somebody else. I mean, obviously yes. I like the term voluntarist, but um so for people that are new to We Are Libertarians, if you you know Google us, we're going to pop up first in Apple, and they may not even have a clue what libertarianism or just curious, and that word mm -hmm. is scary. So how do you define anarchist? Anarchist, an anarchist is someone who recognizes that government is a uniquely terrible way to do things. And not just that government or politicians are, are bad at what they do, but that it's the actual system of government that is the problem. That giving the presumption of authority to a small handful of people is never going to end well. You know, we, we know that 
if you want to get something, there are many different ways that you can get it. You can either make it yourself uh, or you can have someone give it to you or you can work with someone to make it together or you can have someone sell it to you or you can have someone lend it to you uh, or you can have someone, uh, you know, uh, um, um, yeah, I guess lend it to you. You, know, you can have many different voluntary ways of getting that thing. Uh, you can get it through uh, through competition where people uh, work together to bring you, give you something. You can get it through um, uh, through cooperation where you make it together. Uh, you can, you know, that you can get it through these ways, or you can, you can get it through coercion where someone robs you and orders you around and then gives you something you need. If you prove to them that you deserve it. Like if we know that the main ways you can get something that you can buy something or receive something is either through people competing to give it to you in the best way possible or through a monopoly who just, you know, they can give you whatever they want to give you because they're the only game in town. That's what government is. Government is a violent monopoly. And the idea that we're going to get good things or, or get more back than we're getting, having to give to it is foolish. That, that's not going to work. It's immoral. You shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't take their things. You shouldn't order them around. But it also doesn't work. And everything that we're seeing play out is the direct result of what happens when a too much power is in the hands of too few people. And so anarchists believe that by decentralizing that, by dismantling that, and by allowing us to work together to create uh, as the actual stakeholders to create whatever we want, whatever kind of society we want, that that's always going to be better, not perfect, but better than what could be imposed on us by people who probably don't even know us, definitely don't care about us, and have actually been attracted to that power specifically for the purpose of using it for the worst of reasons. That's a very good explanation. Um, <clears throat> so I think it dispels a little bit of what people think an anarchist means, you know, no rules. Uh, you know, obviously no. just complete chaos. And to be fair, anarchists, you know, if you look it up, it has two definitions in the in the dictionary. But for me, and I think what you're saying, it means no rulers. That doesn't mean there's not law or order or things like that. It just means it's it's not a central force through violent coercion. So Right. So anarchy, like if you if you go to a, a Latin, you know, uh, uh, transliteration of the word anarchy, it can mean no rule at all. It can mean like, uh, you know, well, I was about to say Lord of the Flies, but it turns out we were lied to about Lord of the Flies. Did you know that the actual situation with Lord of the Flies wasn't what they painted it to be? Like the actual kids who ended up lost and and, and they actually organized and did fairly well. Uh, there was, were some issues until they were rescued, but it wasn't the way it was portrayed. So even what we're told, like it would be like Lord of the Flies. That's actually a lie. When when those kids were there, there were all, I mean, there were kids that were lost in the in in that were you know um, uh, crashed in the in the woods or whatever. But they actually did better and actually were able to organize something resembling a society until they were saved. It actually was nowhere near as bad as in Lord of the Flies. But it can mean chaos. But the reality is, we have chaos now. You look at riots that are happening, you look at disorder that's happening, you look at crime that's happening, you look at, you know, the, the, the unsafe conditions that people live under, you look at people that are scrambling uh, during a crisis or after a disaster, uh, because they've come to rely on a government that fled and didn't think of them. And <clears throat> this to is that, what to your point there, looks like. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people wait for somebody to do something. And one of the yep. phrases I really like of yours, because uh, when you were running, <clears throat> one of your mantras was you are the power. And, you know, we've mm -hmm. got make America great again, hope and change and things like that. Right. But I think there's something substantially different about looking for an external force to save you and understanding you're the one that can save yourself. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah. how did you come up with that? So it's, I, I wish I could say I came up with you are the power. Um, I have... So You Are the Power actually was originally coined by Dan Smolt, who, uh, who is with the System is Down podcast. And he was making videos uh, back when I was still running with Vermin Supreme. And one of them had the phrase, you are the power. And I looked at it and I went, 
wow, that means so many different things. And so, and I said to him, I said, do you mind if I kind of take this on and, and start using it and, and, and expanding upon what that means? And so I made my first, you know, I'm Spike Cohen and you are the power. And, I, and I've been continuing to do that. And he was like, yeah. So, it, you know, he said, he's told me, he considers it. It's like, you know, he birthed this baby and now he's watching me foster and raise it or whatever. And I'm like, well, technically we're raising it together because you make most of my videos. But um, what you are the power means, there's a lot of different aspects to that and a lot of different purposes behind it. Um, the biggest one is that, well, I guess actually the two biggest ones, I'm not sure one's bigger than the other. One is, is what you said, that when you want something to happen, you have the power and you have the power working with others to do it. The, the power that you're waiting for to accomplish this thing is in you. And it, it will more than likely take cooperation with others. It's, you know, no man is an island, but that spark, that catalyst can be inside of you. Another thing it means is that we are told government has power. There is no such thing as government power. There is what they are willing to make us do and what we are willing to tolerate. We see this all the time, like even something like speed limits. We joke about the fact that if someone's only going a couple miles over the speed limit in the left lane, they need to get the hell, they need to make a law to tell people that are, aren't breaking the law to get the hell out of the left lane. You know, you get over there in the right lane, this lane's for crime. Like the reason that we do that, and, and yet we aren't all being rounded up and arrested and fined every, every single day for doing that. If we go way over the speed limit, yeah, but in most places you can go like up to 10 miles over the speed limit before they're going to give you a hard time because they know that if they really tried to crack down, it would be impossible because the enforcement mechanism of this government that supposedly has all this power makes up like less than a half a percent of the population. They can't enforce it. All they can do is try to make us be scared and try to make us live in fear and then have dangle this, well, if you don't listen, you might be one of those people that we punish. But if enough of us say, fine, then punish us, it goes away. We've seen this with the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. There is pl plenty of people in government right now that would love to keep these lockdowns going indefinitely. They saw when when you started seeing like everyday like soccer moms, not, you know, libertarians or even, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, freedom activists or anything like that, but just everyday moms saying, no, uh, yeah, my kid's not my six year old isn't going to keep wearing a mask. It's not keeping them safe. They come home. It's filthy. They're wearing someone else's mask because they like that Power Ranger better than the one on their mask. This is not helping anything. Uh, my kid's face is filthy. Uh, this is stupid. I'm, we're not doing this anymore. School board after school board dropped it. Government power is illusory. If enough of us say, no, I'm not going to do that, then that goes away either by they actually remove that that order or that rule or they just stop enforcing it. Uh, we're seeing that slowly happen with uh, with cannabis. More and more mm -hmm. people are going, no, no, you can do whatever you want. But we're, I mean, you're even having states saying, no, we're going to just make it legal, even though it's still federally illegal. You are the power. If enough of us get banned together and say, and it doesn't have to be a lot, three to 5% of us banding together and going, no, nah, not going to do it. That makes it go away. That makes that power go away. Um, <clears throat> that's an excellent point you brought up about cannabis too, because I think, uh, um, I have a friend that works for the 10th Amendment Center, and it's mm. something they talk about how decentralization is really moving towards anarchy. And like California just told the federal government, nope, we're not going to do it years ago and became the first to really kind of um, mm -hmm. say, we're just nullifying, we're just not going to do it. And what did they do? They couldn't do anything about it. I mean, sometimes the feds will send, you know, people in to enforce things in states and things like that. But it's true, um, you know, Nobody's go out there like uh, enforcing sodomy laws. They're still on the books, but because it's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> so, Long before what was it? I think it was 2003 that the Supreme Court officially said any 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 sodomy law uh, on the books was was null and void. Right. They hadn't enforced those things in decades. Right. Uh, I think the last time it had been enforced was like well over 15 years prior to that. And in most states, it had been decades where that they had had given up on that. Because I mean, sodomy doesn't necessarily just mean homosexual sexual right. contact. It can mean a, a, a bunch of other non, um, you know, not basically non-vaginal sex by anyone. Well, right. they weren't enforcing that. You can't enforce that. You can't. What are you no going to do? <laughs> like, I mean, this is yeah. like, so, okay. Trans bathrooms. Who is enforcing this? Right. 
like let's like let's really dive into this how does one effectively enforce which is why these bills are all going to die all of these different yeah. trans bills they're all going to die because at some point if someone goes no i'm not going to obey that that means a cop has to show up or a healthcare worker has to show up and decide what they think of this person's genitals yeah like that's that's and it's not going to happen it's not going to happen um all this stuff eventually goes away when enough people stand up and say that's ridiculous. We're not going to obey this. You're going to have to make us. And then they go, well, we weren't able to make you. You just kind of have to. And, and we go, no, we're not going to do it. Oh, okay. Well then I guess you're not going to have to do it anymore. And, and that's the, this is why so many constitutionalists and, and, and libertarians end up becoming anarchists because the logical conclusion of government being, you know, what do we get told? Government's a necessary evil. But it's still evil, right? Like it's government's bad. And we hear, you know, government is a sledgehammer and it's looking for a nail and not every problem's a nail. And then after a while, we're like, yeah, but that sledgehammer sucks. It doesn't even really, it, you, yeah, you, it, it's trying, it thinks everything's a nail, but then the actual nail, it never hits and it just smashes up the wood around it. This sledgehammer is terrible. Um, eventually you realize there isn't a laugher curve on how of you know we, we know that the less government you have the freer you are but when you're a conservative or, or even maybe a minarchist you think there's like a laugher curve there's a point where well yeah well after a certain point too you know too much freedom or or, or too little government leads to bad things happening why mm -hmm. well when bad things happen regardless i don't well, think bad you can look but, for but utopia more things on this happen, yeah yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. I think that's, you know, you'll, you'll speak to somebody, whether they're on the left or the right about the ideas of liberty, even if you're just talking about a really limited government and, but what about this? And what if this happens and they can come up with every idea under the sun, why it yeah. won't work, but they can't tell you why, what is happening now works. <laughs> so, and, and if you ask me, the onus is on them, right? Like we live in their status quo. Right. So if, if that's the status quo right now, and we're saying, I think we could do better. And they go, no, we couldn't. Okay, you defend this then. Yeah. And if you're spending half of your time complaining about one side or the other and how terrible they are, and then you spend the other half of your time complaining that your side isn't fighting back hard enough against that side, I'm starting to think maybe you're getting swindled, pal. Like I, I'm thinking maybe, maybe you're looking at this the wrong way. Uh, I recently heard... Um, uh, we were on a, a clubhouse with uh, Dave Smith and Justin Amash. And um, yes, I, I'm name dropping here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but but we, we, we did a clubhouse. And, uh, you know, Dave was talking about the assertion because Dave's an anarcho capitalist as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the assertion that um, anarchy or anarchists or, or even libertarians are extremists. And he said, basically, if you if you line up what Democrats and Republicans believe, not their 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 talking points, but their actual like what they think government should be doing compared to what we think they should be doing. They're the extremists. You know, we're the ones saying, I think at the very least, government shouldn't be doing all these shouldn't be robbing us and shouldn't be ordering us around and shouldn't be locking people in their homes and telling them they're not essential and shouldn't be sending people around the world to commit mass murder in a perpetual state of war and, and running up trillions of dollars in debt to be paid off by future generations that aren't even born yet. Uh, I think they shouldn't be doing that. And the Democrats and Republicans go, no, not only should they be doing that, but they should be more involved in some other things too. They're the extremists. We're the ones that make more intuitive sense. Yeah. It, it, since when did become becoming uh, nonviolent and wanting to have every uh, action require consent when is that extreme <laughs> like that's the opposite it's like that that's it that's <laughs> it's not like it's not even a pacifist ideal it's just like a good idea a, a good way to interact with your neighbors you know <laughs> if anyone but government talks about doing something without consent they get canceled now yeah. that's the interesting thing is millennials i i'm a i'm a very old millennial i'm like the first millennial so when i say You're millennials, the hey, there's a new phrase for that spike it's called the geriatric millennial I just that's accurate. This. That's how I feel. I legitimately feel geriatric, yeah. right? Like I'm a, I'm a millennial with male pattern baldness. I'm, <laughs> I'm 100% old. When they said, when they came up with the term geriatric millennial, they were looking at this picture <laughs> like this. This is what they pictured when they said that. And as a very, very old millennial, 
uh because i can't even say i'm young gen x because i'm i'm younger than i i don't make the cutoff for gen it's x. 25 so to 40 period. i believe right now is millennial is it is right millennial now? i'm and i'm like 30 i'm gonna be 39 uh later this year <laughs> so i so i'm like the the first millennial of, to do anything right like I, I was the first millennial on a major uh presidential ticket uh and only so far but it's just because i'm that old i was the first one to qualify um, so as a very old millennial, I will say that my, starting largely with my generation and certainly in the, in, in the younger millennials and the Gen Z kids, it's all about consent. Everything is built around consent. They are hyper-focused on consent and not even implied consent, right? We're seeing that with sex, the concept of rape, which for the longest time, rape really just meant like, you know, almost like a forcible decision, you know, to try to force someone into sex. We're now saying, well, technically rape, and, I, and I'm not saying I disagree with this. I'm just saying they've, they've kind of broadened out. Well, what is consent? If you were lied to and that got your consent for sex, you were raped because if you hadn't been lied to, which is a, a form of fraud, uh, then you, uh, or a form of aggression, then you wouldn't have consented. Uh, or if, uh, if you only did it uh, in exchange um, uh, you know, for something bad not happening to you, well, that's a kind of rape because that's coerced sex. And yet, government exists by both implied and direct forceful coercion. It's why it exists. You will never meet, I have yet to meet a single person when they go, you know, taxes are good because they fund our society. And I go, if tomorrow taxes became optional, what would you pay? And they go, well, that's irrelevant. No, that's very relevant. If all taxes were, if, if taxes became, yeah, you pay, you don't pay, whatever. How long would government exist? Seconds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a week. <laughs> Maybe. They just it would print run up so much. <laughs> well, they would, but what would happen is eventually people would be like, I'm not buying these bills. You're, you can't, you can't raise any taxes to pay for it. Like, I mean, it would have, maybe a week. I'd give you a week because there'd be people going, this isn't really happening, right? Like yeah. we're going to go back to, and then after about a week later, people go, oh, so we're, this is over. Okay. All right. It's over. Like, well, they, like the Roman literally... empire fell and there was people out in the country that still thought it was a thing for like a long time. Yeah, exactly. So that, <laughs> that could happen. You could have people that are like, <laughs> who's president right now like, we don't well, have a president all of a sudden all the roads would get huge like fault lines and crack open oh they would like crumble <laughs> yes like it would be like in in uh in the avengers where you know he uh thanos yeah. snapped his finger and th th that would be the roads and like all the goes flags the would roads. tear into pieces you'll just i'm gonna piss people off with that all the statues <laughs> would just start to melt yeah the parks would burst into flames. Yeah. Bald eagles yeah. would start dropping out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> um, the libraries and, would just. <laughs> <laughs> libraries and roads and. Um, libraries and roads. But a lot of people do look at, you know, government. Well, there's infrastructure now. What would happen? And there's a hmm. lot of anarchists that are quite annoying that annoy me. And I'm one uh, that are just like abolish it today. And, you know. FTP, I won't say that. Uh, well, sometimes I, I do swear on the show. So just be prepared. all corgis are beautiful. <laughs> but and there's and there's some merit to being frustrated with that. But we're talking a little bit about decentralizing. So some people might say, well, you're running for political office. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just going to become one of them. But there's a little truth to pulling things back little by little. I mean, th there is a good chance that the economy could collapse and we could all live in an anarchy in a year or two. But Hopefully not, because that would hurt a lot of people. So I was going to say, hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. we can do this a better way than that. Yeah. So what is your vision for like using politics and the platform to decentralize? Like what, what was your goal when you said, well, I'm going to run? So this is interesting because it wasn't that long ago that I was one of those people that was like, I never really disparaged <laughs> Libertarian Party people, but I was always like, I think at, at worst, you're not really you're not doing you're not doing any harm you know the people that are like oh the libertarian party is giving credence to the exit no the libertarian party is just at worst they're not helping anything right that was always my thought but i also thought they weren't really helping anything and then i started talking with libertarians it actually started with my show i had libertarian party people on i'm like yeah sure i'll have them come on and i would i would bring them on and i'd be like so shouldn't there really not even be a government and they're like yeah no there shouldn't and i'm like yes so why are you in the libertarian party and then i started having these conversations and they're like 
Yeah, because we're going to use the Libertarian Party as a vehicle, number one, first and foremost, to provide the message of liberty to the public. There are a lot of people, and I've seen this firsthand. If I had gone around a couple of years ago, three years ago, knocking on doors and saying, hey, I'm Spike Cohen, I'd like to talk with you about liberty, they would have been like, no, I'm good. But if I, but now, hey, I'm Spike Cohen. I was running for, or last year especially, I'm running for vice president and I'd like to talk. You're running for vice president of America? Yeah, sure, I'd love to talk with you. Or getting interviews. You know, I'm on national media now that I get interviews on because I was the LPVP candidate. Now, what am I doing? I'm going on there and saying perfectly libertarian stuff. I've even dropped the A word a couple times on there. Like I, I do not shy away from the reality that we would all do better if we were more free all the way to being completely free. Mm -hmm. That is the number one purpose of the Libertarian Party is as a messenger for freedom to people who otherwise would not be receptive to hearing it. While we are doing that, if we are able to leverage that mechanism, that vehicle to also push for actual legislative policy changes to help people right now, fully cognizant of the fact that there is no Rothbard button. I wish there was. I'd smash that thing until my finger was broken if I had to. But it doesn't exist. You cannot get rid of government until you change minds of people mm -hmm. and show them that our ideas work. And the way that we do that, and we can use the Libertarian Party as part of this platform, part of this, this uh, strategy and this vehicle for doing so, we get involved with our communities. We get in front of the city councils and county councils, which whether you like it or not, they are the people that are running things. And you go there and you present your proposal for what needs to be changing, like actual common sense things that can happen right now. Don't just go there and go, here's some articles of dissolution, sign this, like actual things, like let's end no-knock rates, let's end mm -hmm. the war on drugs, let's let's decriminalize drugs, let's uh, decriminalize sex work, let's decriminalize gun ownership, let's let's end, uh, let's get rid of, let's expunge all the records of people that have, uh, you know, convictions for victimless crimes, you know, actual things that can be done that you can get popular support for. Let's make, let's, let's get rid of bans on feeding homeless people. Let's really do things that help help people right now. And when we do that, we show people around us that we care more than anyone else about the problems everyone's facing and that we have the best solutions for how to fix that, that we understand better than anyone else what the problem is and we understand the best how to fix it. When we do that, you know, the, the, the joke of, you know, we're going to take over the world and leave you alone. I don't really like that because it implies an impossibility, right? We're going to take over the world. We don't want to take over the world. We want to dismantle systems of power. And the best way to do that is to walk in front of them, expose them for the frauds they are. And yeah, you may temporarily replace them. And then the next step is to work your way up until eventually you can just start dismantling things. If I had magically become president, if by some miracle, everyone accidentally voted for me and Joe, like, because I mean, that's clearly what would have had to be since 90 something percent of people didn't even know who we were. If that had happened, then we would have immediately gotten to work just dismantling stuff as much as we could. That That's the whole purpose. I guess the last part I'll say to that is, and maybe this was your next question, so I'm already answering it. You know, what do you say to the libertarian that says voting is violence, voting is the, you know, giving uh, implicit consent to the system and, and, and legitimizing the system and everything else? First of all, the number thing, one thing I would tell you is I appreciate and respect your principles and your um, your uh, dedication uh, and your your commitment to to not uh, in, implicitly or explicitly giving legitimacy or respect to the system. And I'm not going to try to shame you into voting. I'm going to because again, I wasn't that far. I, I was right where you were not that long ago, two, three years ago, I was right where you were. What I'm telling you is, I can give you my perspective, voting is violence. And if you vote for people that are working to set people free. If you vote for actual libertarians and anarchists, it is a vote of self-defense. It is a vote that cancels out someone else's vote for more tyranny, or at least a maintenance of the status quo of tyranny. It does not give credence to an existing power structure to use it to say, I do not consent to what you're doing. Do you want us to increase taxes? No, I do not. Uh, do you want us to get rid of this tax? Yes, I do. 
do you want us to lower this tax? Yes, but I actually want to get rid of it entirely, which is why I'm voting for this person who's going to end taxes. So it is, you know, it is not perfect. It's not the Rothbard button, but in a reality that we live in where the vast majority of people believe that we need this, it can be a very powerful tool to fight back. And that's pretty much what it is. I think that's probably, honestly, Spike, the best explanation I've heard of it. <laughs> that's a really difficult question to answer. And I was actually in your boat to voting as violence and almost like like going towards an agorist, which I love agorists. And I have a lot of very principled anarchist friends that will not vote. And I, I really hate when people vote shame too. So, you know, you do you. Nobody, I'm you don't owe anybody shaming. anything. <laughs> you owe no one anything. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even shame people who said, you know what? I think I got to vote lesser evil. You know how I feel about that? I think you're being scandal. You're yeah. being swindled. You're being sh shamed. But if you feel like that's the best way to use your vote, I'm not, what am I going to do? Give you a hard time about that? Yeah. Like, at least you told me it's a, it's a, it's a secret ballot. And I wouldn't have even known if you hadn't told me. Um, and I, by the way, talking about some of the other things, political, I believe political electoral politics is one of the tools we can use. Agorism and counter economics is 100% another tool we can use. Free market solutions to problems that we're facing is absolutely a tool we can use. Illegalism, well, counter economics, yeah. these are all things that we can use. There I, is I'm so no... excited about that. And I want yeah. to talk to you about that because I have so many questions okay, about what we can do, you know, sure, sure, besides sure. using the political system. But I have to take a really quick break okay. um, for our sponsors. And we will be right back with Spike Cohen, people. Hello, welcome back to Ginger Arky. I'm Trisha Stewart Mann. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'm talking to Spike Cohen. He is the former um, Libertarian Vice Party Vice Presidential candidate from 2020. He is an anarchist. He has a, an amazing Wikipedia page that you guys have to check out. You could probably want to save those photos to your yeah. phone. Go ahead share them with some that. friends, me, mom. Anyways, we were show talking your, a little- Show your commitment to libertarianism by making this your profile picture <laughs> with no context or explanation. I hate this picture. So <laughs> it really, you just, and in your mouth's not quite open. It's just like- It's just so, it's like so, so the background on this, this is for those who missed the first half, this is the background on this is I, it's 120 degrees in this photo. Um, in Tempe, Arizona. And I've been talking for, I think, two or three hours at this point. And I just was done. And I was trying, that's my brave face. I was done. My hair was done. My entire body was done. Internally, I was even more done than I was externally. And uh, I still braved it out for like another hour or so. And uh, so this, this photo is what fighting back from defeat looks like but it's not pretty and i i don't you're probably going to use this as like the promo photo for this episode i'm sure well i'll probably have to meme it first if i'm going to be honest okay <laughs> it's not that bad although it doesn't look like any of your other photos and i've met that's you what i mean it doesn't look that's like that's what people. i mean like i've never i don't look like this <laughs> and this is the first thing it's just sad. Like, look at the hair. Like, I just, I, I look like it's over. The little bang thing, you know, when the, this coming down. This is what it being so hot out that your hair gel has disintegrated and does, and like, this is just, this is a man that is ready to go to bed. <laughs> well, you, I know that, um, I might be going a little bit off here, but Hey, it's my show. Um, I know that you do um, have multiple sclerosis. And so doing mm -hmm. tours and things like that, that's got to be incredibly difficult. I mean, I don't understand how you find the energy and the strength to do that. So first of all, when you are doing something that you love and brings you tremendous fulfillment, you can do so much more of it than if you were doing something, well, especially something you hated or even just something that didn't bring you a tremendous amount of joy. If I were trying to put this much energy into something else, I wouldn't be able to do it. Not just because I, you know, I have MS or, you know, I'm not a kid anymore, but because just my body, you know, I, I'm just, I, I think all of us have our limits of, of what we can do that we hate before we give up. In fact, 
the reason I retired from my, my business, my web design business is because when I got MS and they said, you need to, you need to, you know, reduce your stress as much as possible because stress will make your MS much worse. And I thought, well, and they're like, what's bringing you the most stress? And I'm like, besides the MS, uh, the, uh, that my, my, my business, um, that's definitely, and I had thankfully reached a point where I really didn't have to make money anymore. I'm not a billionaire or anything like that, but I didn't have to make money anymore, uh, to be able to live. And so I thought, well, that's the first thing that can go. And then the next thing was, you know, after spending several months kind of relearning how to live healthfully, you know, before that it was like, I ate whatever I wanted. I didn't really, you know, work out. I didn't really do much other than just work and make money. Um, after relearning how to eat right, how to live right, how to be more mindful, how to be less raging through life, then I started thinking, well, what is it I want to do? What brings me fulfillment? And I knew what brought me the most fulfillment was talking to people about liberty and freedom, that I, telling people that it doesn't have to be this way, that we can do better by being more free. And that brought me to this. And when I say that I'm the happiest I have ever been in my life, I am not exaggerating. Um, it is short of outside of my marriage, this is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. And I'm grateful for the work that I did prior that put me in a position where I can afford to devote my life to this. So I'm not, I'm not saying money means nothing or anything like that. Cause it clearly that's definitely not the case. Um, but the reason I'm able to do as much as I do, even when I get tired, even when, again, in this photo, I'm done. Like I'm getting the tunnel vision. Like it was bad. This happened in Nebraska too. I didn't look. Get a little bad. one of those and put it back on my bookshelf. <laughs> Just have it there. Yeah. Where people are like, what is that? Like, so <laughs> the, the, this, this, had I been doing this, <laughs> had I been doing this, doing something else, I would have been like, guys, I'm done. I'm finished. But instead I did a couple hours more and I slept for four hours and we were at the next event doing the same thing the following morning. Um, and you saw me in, in Ohio yeah. where I did that starting. I woke up that morning at 4.30, having gone to bed at two. And I woke up at 4.30 to get ready for our first event that was at six. And you saw me at like, what, like 8.30? It was at nighttime. 9.30, yeah. yeah. You saw me at night. I did two more events after that. Do, and Do you feel like that's good? Like you're still doing well doing that? Is you're able to manage your health? Yeah, no. I So uh, my we were, I, I was actually curious, like, so I get a MRI every year, uh, usually around March, but not always, but every year just to see like, you know, and it's an MRI of my brain and my spine and it's, it's how are you doing? Like, you know, and I, I've been stable for four years now, no new attacks, no new anything like that. Um, and uh, my symptoms have been roughly about the same. Some have gotten a little bit better. Some have gotten a little worse. Most of them stayed about the same. So I've been stable. That's really good for someone with MS to be stable for like mm -hmm. five years now. Um, and um, after I got an MRI this March um, or MRIs of my, my brain and spine, and I was interested. I'm like, I wonder if there was some damage here. Cause I definitely like, I went hard every day. I went hard. I got on average about three to four hours of sleep and all of my waking hours were doing events, interviews, appearances, fundraisers, uh, writing content for the social media, uh, you know, planning out stuff for the future events. Like it was constant. It was, I was never not on. And I was, you know, it was like 20 hours a day doing this for months. And I thought there had to be some new damage, no new damage, no degeneration, nothing. Well, it was like, yeah, I was actually su pleasantly surprised, but I shouldn't have been because I didn't have any new symptoms or anything like that. So yeah, no, I, I, when you are in your joy and when you are doing something that brings you tremendous fulfillment, you can do a thousand times more than you could do otherwise. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to be in the position I'm in. Well, I want to say that's something I admire about you because I know it can't be easy. <clears throat> I'm just this teeny weeny little person and I get a lot of attacks for what I believe. I can't imagine being like on a national stage or going around and putting up with people because sometimes I just have to step back <laughs> um, putting up, and then still loving it and doing it and having passion when you go out and do it, which is um, what I find most admirable about you. 
But I do want to get back to something we were talking about earlier, because yeah. this is really exciting to me. Um, so we were talking about, you know, using politics and the LP platform to, you know, mm -hmm. let people know there's something else out there. But there's also right. another way that could lead down the beautiful road to anarchy, and that's decentralizing. Mm -hmm. And um, you're talking about counter economics. Mm -hmm. And I'm specifically interested in cryptocurrency, especially more yeah. as of late. So what do you think are the ways that people could right now work towards anarchy? So first, before we get started, I want to say that some of the things we are about to talk about are of questionable or outright non-legality. Um, and so I'm not going to say anything that should be perceived. This is my disclaimer. Uh, nothing that is being said here by Trisha Stortman and uh, Jeremy Spike Cohen uh, uh, should be construed in any way to be uh, encouraging you to commit a crime. We are simply giving a scholastic academic discussion about the things that could theoretically be done. Hypotheticals, people. Hypothetically. Now, and there's also many things that can be done that are perfectly legal, or at least there's not really a, a, a strong uh, uh, prohibition or, or regulation of these things. But number one, uh, just the use of cryptocurrency, uh, which this actually is legal, just the use of cryptocurrency whenever possible in your day-to-day -day transactions is a powerful way of divorcing not just that transaction, but as much of your contribution to the economy away from fiat currency and towards a free market decentralized form of currency, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, Litecoin, Cardano, Monero, whatever, like uh, any of these. Um, it is a way of saying, I reject your monopoly money that you use to uh, impose your will on us and and the planet, really. I mean, petrodollars mm -hmm. is why most wars are fought, is to try to force foreign banks to hold U.S. Treasury notes, IOUs, in their uh, in their as their as their reserve currency in their reserves. Um, so, I mean, you are you are when you are using fiat, you are inadvertently or 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 without your consent participating in imperialism, both here and abroad. So anytime that you can use crypto, uh, not only is it a more sound form of money, uh, but it's also a powerful way of divorcing yourself from that system. And some choose, not telling you to do this, but some people choose when doing that to not participate in the tax part of that. Now, the government requires that all taxation uh, be paid in US dollars and in, in fiat currency. And most, pretty much all governments do this. They require that you pay your taxes in whatever their official currency is. Not all, but most. Um, certainly the US does. So you could just not. Again, that's your choice. Um, so that's a very powerful way. Probably the single most powerful counter economic means of, of working towards a freer society is starving the beast, starving the, the mechanism that funds the monster that oppresses everyone, if you chose to do something like that. Um, then you can get into the weeds with like doing, coming up with free market solutions to things that are not necessarily legal. Like for example, um, long before you started seeing governments allowing things like needle exchanges, you had uh, uh, mostly anarchist groups that were illegally handing out clean needles to people. They would buy or get donations of, of uh, uh, syringes, uh, clean, sterile syringes, and they'd hand them out. And the reason they were doing this was not to, not to encourage drug use. It was to stop the spread of AIDS and all these other bloodborne dise diseases um, that were spreading through the addict community, which also then went to non-addicts, you know, people that they were interacting with. And so they, they helped put an end to that. And uh, in doing so, they would also sometimes give them food. Uh, they would encourage them to get involved in, uh, you know, in, in people that would help them to get off of that drug if they so chose. But in the meantime, if you're going to continue using here, do it safely. Some of them went to jail for this. They actually went to jail for, you know, a conspiracy to aid and abet someone in the distribution of drugs and all this. And um, but they did it anyway because they knew it was the right thing to do. Uh, there are people, uh, and we were uh, actually doing this before uh, the, the pandemic hit and no one wanted to, to really do it during a pandemic. It didn't look good. We were going around feeding the homeless. 
in uh, cities where uh, where it was illegal to do so without spending thousands of dollars to get the licensing and health inspections and all that stuff to give someone a sandwich that you just made. And it's not hard to find a place where that's illegal. It's illegal pretty much everywhere, actually. Um, there are very few places where it's not illegal to just give out food to people outside of your home um, without you know, having it inspected by the health department and all of that stuff. Um, so there are many different things. Um, 3D manufacturing is a perfect example of this. Um, I, I recently tweeted that, you know, um, um, 3D manufacturing is becoming so advanced and so prolific that very soon, not only will the opinion of government as to what kind of weapon you can and can't own, not only will that opinion become irrelevant, but you will be able to, again, if you chose to do such a thing like this, I certainly wouldn't advise it, it's illegal. But if you chose to, uh, you and your closest friends uh, could, at, from the comfort of your home, create and distribute the absolute cutting edge of, of, of technology for small arms from the comfort of your 3D printer at a fraction of the price and exponentially faster than the military industrial complex and the police industrial complex can. So that that's so about cool. to change. That's about to completely change. You think that the the power imbalance is, is big now with just the sheer number of American gun owners that already exist? Imagine what happens when they can own whatever the hell they want and no one even knows. Yeah. Well, um, a lot of, of people, you know, obviously this is a basic libertarian point, but again, there's a lot of people that yep. listen that don't even understand half the stuff we're talking about. You know, right. they say, well, if, if you don't ban assault weapons or you don't ban certain type of magazines or guns, and then won't mm -hmm. more people get hurt. <laughs> and if we have more guns, don't more people get hurt. What would you say to them? <laughs> well, I'd say that we know that's the opposite. So if you look at the places where there's the most gun violence, we see two things. Number one, we see little to no legal civilian gun ownership. And number two, we see gigantic police departments, huge governments with huge uh, or relatively huge uh, law enforcement mechanisms. So let's say, you know, nationwide law enforcement makes up maybe half a percent of the population. In these places, they make up like two or 3% of the population. Like there's a much bigger enforcement mechanism. You go to New York City, or you go to Chicago, or you go to Detroit, uh, or go to New Orleans, there's police everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. And yet, there's way more violence, in, especially gun violence in those areas, right? Now, this makes sense. Once you get past this very, very basic guns equal death cal calculation, if you look at it from a common sense perspective, okay, if the only people that have guns are people that either don't care what the law is or are above the law in their carrying and usage of it, it stands to reason that that's going to result in those guns being used against people who have no ability to defend themselves. If the vast majority of people who mean no one else harm, and the only reason they'd ever have a gun is if they, it, well, first of all, you know, just to have fun with it, you know, target practice, shooting watermelons or, you know, uh, water bottles or whatever, but to use it against a person would be to defend themselves or someone else. In other words, the exact people that we would never worry about having a gun, mm -hmm. if they're the only people that are actually affected in not being able to have a gun, well, then, yeah, that's going to mean that it's going to be a lot more violence. And in contrast, when you look at areas that have massive amounts of gun ownership, where there's a very deeply ingrained gun culture, where children learn how to use weapons as little kids, their first guns in their hand as a toddler, and their first learning gun safety at five, six, seven years old, those are the areas with almost no gun violence. Mm -hmm. And the rare times that guns are used, except for suicide. Because if you look, when they talk about gun violence is rampant, two thirds of that gun violence is suicides. And that is 
terrible and devastating. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, it doesn't count because they killed themselves. It absolutely counts. It's a devastating thing when someone kills themselves. The reality is they would have killed themselves regardless. If you erased every single gun, if there was a gun button you could press that made all guns go away, those people would still, unfortunately, unless we intervene in the mental health issues that they're having or the traumatic issues that they're having, they're still going to kill themselves. So Which the is, vast majority of gun violence is going to happen anyway. We but were talking we, we about outlawing gun. things. And I think there's some places yeah. where suicide is outlawed. And it's like, yeah, it is a suicide is illegal. Thing, yeah. But does that even yeah. make any sense? Has anybody ever thought I'm in such a depressive and horrible state? I want to take my life, but dang it, the government said I can't. They're gonna kill me with the fines if I do this yeah. thing. Like it, it's, I mean, I've seen. I remember they, they, uh, there was a stand-up comedian. I wish I could remember who it was, but it was back in the '80s. It's like, okay, suicide's illegal. What are you gonna do to them? <laughs> like, stop trying to kill yourself, or I'll shoot. Like, what you know. What are you going to do to this person? If you don't kill you, if you don't stop killing yourself, that's going to go on your permanent record. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it is ridiculous, but a lot of people look at something on the face and think if we ban it, then it will stop. And I yes. think it's just, they've never had it explained. Like you're explaining or the libertarian idea that, you know, yeah. government doesn't legislate morality and they don't make good or bad things. They don't actually make anything. So right. <laughs> if something's bad, you can't just make a law and think that people won't do it. That's that never works. It's never worked in history. You know, <laughs> it, it doesn't work. Government is a, is a government is a tool that tries to get things done through a coercively funded model. So for example, if you and I wanted to start a, a chicken sandwich store and we said, but we got this really cool way of funding it. And this way, we won't have to worry about marketing. Everyone that walks by our store, we're just going to point guns at them and make them give us money. And we're going to make them tell us what they owe us. We're not even going to tell them what they owe us. They're going to tell us. And, but if they get it wrong, they're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're going to have to give us money. But then they can come and get a chicken sandwich. If we decide they need it. We got this criteria. You got you to go through some red tape. But I promise you, you're going to get a sandwich if you absolutely need it. Who here what, listening to this or watching this, who thinks for even a second that would go well, that that would people would be happy with this arrangement? That is literally how our government works. By the way, I'm talking to you, Minarchist. When you say, uh, and I love you, and you are my ally, and I love working with you on stuff all day long. I'd certainly not give you a hard time. But you tell us government is so terrible and so so much of an evil that it should only be reserved for the things we absolutely need the most like our protection and first response to emergencies and the very infrastructure that we use to get through life. And I guess parks and libraries, maybe. Uh, although most minarchists are cool with free market parks and libraries, but oh, in the court system, oh, we hate the government so much that they should only be reserved for things like arbitrating every single disagreement we have. Yes, deciding punishments for actual crimes. <laughs> deciding be punishments really for crimes. That. Yeah, no, we, there's <laughs> such an evil thing that we should only put them in charge of the absolute yeah. backbone of our society. It, it's funny. I ask this question a lot because um, I know you weren't born a, an anarchist. I believe you were no. um, a bit of a right right winger like I, I used was to a be. neocon. I was yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. I actually worked mm -hmm. for McCain camp. <laughs> wow. My my family's very political, and so I was very much involved in it. No, but um, don't feel bad. I, I was already starting to become somewhat more libertarian. And yet I still voted for John McCain, but only because that meant that Sarah Palin was just a heartbeat away. I, I was Chris. that when they announced, OK, please don't stop listening to Ginger argue. OK, I'm telling you about my past. I'm different. I've changed. <laughs> But when when she, I think Glenn Beck, I was listening to Glenn Beck at the time wow. and he announced it was Sarah Palin and I'm like looking her up and I'm like, this girl's got it. She's a, she's a hockey mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, it's good to look back and laugh at that stuff. Yes. But you know, I'm not an unintelligent person and I thought like that. So I really, I can't blame other people for it. It's, it's hard when you're kind of stuck in the matrix and that's life and you're just trying to live your yes. life, you know, you don't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is why I tell libertarians, anarchists, when you are talking to normies, understanding that we are vastly outnumbered by them, but even if we weren't, even if we were in the majority and we were still outreaching to them, 
remember that you probably weren't where you are right now. The perfect libertarian that you are in this very moment that will never change your opinion ever again, having in this very second reached the pinnacle of understanding of all things, understand that you, like me, super <laughs> saiyan and cap that I am, having reached my final form, <laughs> keep in mind that not everyone's where you are yet. You weren't where you were at one point. I often say to myself, when I'm getting frustrated with someone, I'm explaining, you know, like the Jones Act. I put out a thing about how terrible the Jones Act was. And I have people going, who's going to protect my maritime job? And I'm like, just read this thing. It, it, it's destroying the maritime industry. Like it's terrible. But when I get frustrated, I say to myself, what would neocon spike need to hear right now when neocon spike would show up and go about who's gonna fight the islamo fascists that hate us for our freedom you have to respond to that you have to have an answer to that and it can't be hey you're a bootlicker and you don't care about other people because then i go i'm not a bootlicker i hate you and then i walk away right so you have to have an answer to that okay and maybe spend just a moment trying to meet them where they are and empathize that they actually have legitimate concerns they just have a really bad take on how to how to solve that problem so we can all do with a little bit of grace of remembering we weren't always perfect we hadn't reached the absolute pinnacle of understanding yet and and you know as we help others to as the sherpas that we are to move people up the uh mount everest that is our final form of understanding that we reached just a handful of just a few seconds ago oh, yeah we just got here <laughs> and man does it feel good to be perfectly right finally right but as we're bringing people up there's has to be a little bit of of, of grace there or or we're, we're going to lose them because they're they're going we already sound so crazy compared to everyone else we have to sound the most reasonable the most graceful the most empathetic the most kind to make them go wait, how, why are you so happy? Like, why are you so graceful to me and nice to me and get them to, to, you know, come along. We have to be evangelists for what we're, for what we believe. Uh, that's a, an excellent point. Um, oftentimes I, I think in our small little teeny weeny circle of people, instead of doing that, we just kind of turn inwards and hit each other, which is really dumb considering there's like five of us. Uh <laughs> it's so weird. It's um, like we wake up and we go, you know what the problem with this movement is? There's too many of us. <laughs> and some of us aren't perfect yet. <laughs> Let's go after them hardest. And then that way, when someone shows up and they go, hi, what? Libertarianism, wow, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. Man, that sounds good. I wonder where you go. Oh my God. <laughs> and they see us just uh, destroying each other over something like, the age of consent yeah. law in a specific state or something. And it's like, and you can just see the commenters that are like, and then, we, and they go, and they'll leave, God forbid one of them says, you know, I was interested in what you guys had to say, but you all just seem really angry. And then we all or immediately stop <laughs> what we're doing to turn on them. Yeah. And there's just a, just in case they had any doubt that they should run away yeah. for the hills and never look back. We make sure to leave them with a nice, you know, one last scrape at yeah. the back of their, their ankle as they're running away. Like it's, you know, it, I don't get, let's not do that. Uh, I think it leads me to, I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. I always have been my whole life, which is eventually what led me to be an anarchist and actually changed a right. lot of uh, what I believe as far as my personal faith in life. But I think a lot of people kind of take on libertarianism and it does, there is, um, it's very attractive to young men um that perhaps uh you know might have some social issues not that there's all kinds of libertarians of many stripes but and i often wondered why and i think a lot of people look at libertarianism as some sort of faith and um instead of just mm -hmm. a great idea of how to interact with people so i ask a lot of my guests this question what does libertarianism lack libertarianism the belief i don't believe lacks anything libertarians often lack empathy and and i think this is actually a symptom of what they actually lack which is intuition of social circles and here's what i mean by that we tend to be very, we have a lot of uh analysts we have a lot of engineers we have a lot of 
business owners, we have a lot of people that when they see something happen, instead of saying, wow, that's great, or oh no, that's so terrible, we immediately, we skip the, the emotional response and go towards what caused that? Why did that happen? We do have a very brief, oh wow, that's terrible. Oh wow, that's great. But we, we immediately go to what caused that? Why'd that happen? How do we have more of that? Or how do we make sure that never happens again? Or how do we reduce that? That's great. But this is the eternal, you know, you've got like a, a married couple and one spouse is, you know, saying that they're upset about something that happened that day. And the other one's saying, all right, well, what do you want me to do? How can I fix it? And then the spouse, and it's usually the husband doing this and the wife, not always, but usually it's, and I'm saying generally speaking, sometimes it's the other way. Sometimes obviously there are same sex couples and whatever, but typically, generally speaking, you got the wife, she's upset and she wants to talk it out. And in talking it out, then we can maybe come up with what a solution is, but, but she wants to talk it out. She wants to talk about how it upsets her. And, and then the guy's like, all right, well, what, who do you want me to call? What can I do? What can we take? How can, and then she's going, no, I just want you to listen to me. And it's like, I, I am listening. What, how do I, I want to fix this thing? How do we make it work? See, so at least there, there's an understanding that the husband actually wants to help. We do that without them even understanding we want to help first. So someone goes, wow, um, we, I see this so often with healthcare. Man, the cost of healthcare is just so high. And I'm worried that my kid's going to end up in a hospital or I'm going to end up in a hospital, right? Especially right now with the pandemic. What if I end up in a hospital and I survive, but I get stuck, you know, we don't have insurance. I get stuck with a, you know, $80,000 bill and I have to go bankrupt or pay this thing off for the next 30 years ruins me financially. You know, it seems to me like healthcare should be a human right. We should just be able to go and get healthcare, right? Uh, other countries are so wealthy. We're the wealthiest country on earth, I'm told. And yet there are people that can't even get healthcare because they can't afford it. That doesn't seem to make sense. There are these other countries that are wealthy and their healthcare is free. Why can't we have that? It's a legitimate now, most question. People, <laughs> these are legit <laughs> yeah. questions, right? And most people, when they hear this, whether they agree with it or disagree, they're like, yeah, that's terrible. That's, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I also don't want these things to happen. We should look at what we what 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 the problem is here, but but this is wrong. No, I I think you should get healthcare, uh, and 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 they may even say they agree healthcare is a human right. They may even say they agree that it should be free or government financed or whatever. We show up and go, healthcare is not a human right. You don't know what rights are. There's only negative rights. You don't have a right to someone else's labor. What do you believe in slavery? Oh, I bet you would have thought you had a right to cotton back in the 1800s, wouldn't you? You bootlicking status. No wonder your kid's sick. Like, this is how we talk to people. Yeah. Or we'll start defending the status quo of healthcare in this country, even though we don't like it, because it's better than in those countries. And we go, those countries aren't rich. They're heavily in debt. And meanwhile, this person's like, what they said is I'm scared, and what can we do about this? Yeah. They're literally asking you, even if it's not necessarily in the best faith, because sometimes mm -hmm. they come in to try to gotcha, they're still saying, I'm scared, how can we fix this? Now, if instead, the way I approach healthcare with someone that wants Medicare for all or whatever, is first of all, I say, yeah, no, our healthcare system sucks. Our government's spending more money per patient than almost any other country on earth. And then we spend two or three times that much outside of that. We're spending like four times the developed nation average. And our, our, our outcomes aren't all that much better than the average developed country. They're a little bit better, but not that much better than the average. Some countries are doing even better than us. It sucks. It's a terrible system. We need to look at why that is. And I'll often say my phrase I like to use is, you know, you see Republicans and Democrats are arguing over who should be paying for this huge and you know exponentially growing bill for healthcare should it be the taxpayer should it be the patient some combination of those things but why do they never talk about why the bill is so damn high to begin with that compels people the fact that i showed i cared and then presented them with a question that made them go yeah why aren't we talking about that and then i answer that question and i talk about the things that are making healthcare so expensive and then I give them some grace by saying, hey, listen, whether you want Medicare for all, whether you want a free market healthcare system, whoever you want to pay the bill, let's focus on making that bill lower so that no matter which way we go, it's more sustainable, more people can get care. It doesn't bankrupt us in the process, either individually or as a nation. And we are able to actually get the care that we need and see innovations in the market.
Now I've got someone on my side, maybe not 100%, but it's certainly better than me calling them a bootlicking status, uh, a slavery supporter and making them walk away saying, wow, I don't know what libertarianism, it, libertarianism is, but I hate it and everyone who believes in it. Um, <laughs> We have to empathize with people. We have to meet them where they are. This is an old, I learned this in the business world a long time ago. You have to meet people where they are. You have to empathize with them. No one cares what you know until they know that you care. Once they see that you care, then you can start talking about how we got here. And then you can start talking about how we can get out of it. And you don't have to water down the message. You don't have to try to, you know, uh, pander to them or say things you don't believe in or agree with. You can take them down that that journey, and you can take them all the way to anarchy if you want to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I talked with uh, you know teachers about why we need to abolish the Department of Education. The way I presented it, they were hundred percent on board because I showed I cared about them and their students. Um, that's that's why you were the vice presidential candidate. <laughs> yes, um, that's why they hired me. As as I say often, that's why they hired me. Honestly, you do remind me a little bit, um, in certain ways, uh, of Harry Brown. Uh, he had a way of practically speaking to people about their lives in a positive wow. way. <laughs> I don't think the bootlicking statist ever came out of his mouth. <laughs> I hope not. I that is that is actually an incredible compliment. Thank you, Trisha. Well, you're very Harry welcome. Brown is someone I, I I quote him often, and I look up to him very much. I would argue that Harry was probably the best vice presidential candidate we've ever had. And I know that's a sacrilege to, to the Ron Paul people. I love Ron Paul. Ron Paul was one of the people that was instrumental in bringing me in and seeing the stuff that he put out in the eighties when he was running was incredible. Um, and, and obviously the stuff he did afterwards has been incredible too. I had certainly nothing against Ron Paul in my personal opinion. I think the best presidential candidate we've ever had was I Harry Brown. Um, I agree. Yeah, I, that's my that's my personal thing. I, he, he's just, just a very inspiring person. Very inspiring. And, that, and yep. we need a little bit yep. more of that and a little less depression. Listen, we've had clowns in office for a long time. <laughs> we, we just went, you know, now we yes. have Uncle Joe and we just got through the orange guy. And, the, yes. and we just, you know, I'd rather be inspired than angry. So, <clears throat> yes. um, so now you're moving on. You've, you've done your, you know, your run, your race. Are you mm -hmm. thinking about jumping back in? I know that you've been doing some stuff on Fox. You're growing your media company. What, what are you yep. planning on doing? Are you just never going to say? I'm never getting, I'm not telling. So I actually have some exciting news coming out this summer um, okay. uh, about some very, very exciting stuff that we're doing. And I am intentionally being coy about what it is. You're changing but your Wikipedia page. I'm changing my Wikipedia and I need your help. Okay. No, I, uh, I, I am changing my, and if anyone wants to help with that, please, God, please, please, <laughs> yeah, please help. Yes, please. Um, but yes, I, uh, starting this summer, uh, everything is about to change and, uh, got some very, very exciting stuff we're working on. And I hope that you'll want to be a part of it. And if you'd like to be among the first to find out what we're doing, go to spikecohen.com slash first, and, uh, you will be on the extra special spike waiting list. That's like the worst way to present this, but you will be you will be on a on a, on the list of people that finds out before anyone else what it is we're starting this summer. Can you give us like a just a hint? We are going to set America free. Wow, you better and throw you that picture up one more time so I can be inspired. <laughs> we are going to set America free. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I'm a big fan of makeup and I have to, I'm dying. Every time you put that up, it's making me cry. And I think my eyelashes. <laughs> I didn't put my eyelashes in just specifically because I knew that photo would make me laugh. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Spike. It was a pleasure. I'm looking forward to your big announcement. I'm looking forward to being free. I'm never going to do anything for Liberty again. I'm just going to wait. Just wait till this <laughs> summer. It's already summer. It's not even going to be that long. Just wait. <laughs> just stop doing everything else. <laughs> and just wait. Now, in the meantime, if you want to come out and see me, uh, spikecohen.com. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to spikecohen.com, uh, if you go down to the events section, you can see all the events I have coming up. You can see all the uh, the um, any interviews that I have coming up. Those are on there as well. Um, and uh, I'd love to meet you in person. Uh, if you want to come out and see me uh, at any of the events I'm going to be at, uh, I'm in a different state every single weekend. 
Um, this coming weekend, I'm going to be in Lakeland, Florida for the uh, Libertarian Party of Florida convention. Uh, then the following weekend, I will be in Greensboro, North Carolina for the North Carolina convention. Then the following weekend, I will be in beautiful downtown somewhere in Michigan, the Soaring Eagle Casino in Michigan for the uh, Libertarian Party of Michigan convention. Then after that, I'm going to be, I believe, in Chicago. Then after that, I'm going to be, I think, in Tunica, Mississippi. And then oh. after that, I'm going to be, or I'm going to be after that. You're you going to play some blackjack. Probably. I hope so. Um, and then at some point, I'm going to be in Virginia Beach with the Concerned Veterans of America. Oh, cool. um, and then I'm going to be, I'm like, literally, if you go, if you go to my event, we're booked out through like September. You're um, really good at remembering all that stuff. I mean, I know you have an assist, but I can't believe that. I would, if I, I was I, you, I wouldn't know where I was going to be tomorrow. To be honest. I'm impressed. Well, know I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. I have no idea. <laughs> probably, probably, hopefully napping. Um, but no, I'm going to be, uh, so I will be more than likely at or near your neck of the woods, uh, at some point in, uh, in my life. And, um, so stay tuned on spikecohen.com. You can check out all my upcoming events. And, uh, and if you want to come out and meet me, I'd love to meet you. I love answering questions. The reason again, that I look like this was I spent two hours answering Q and a from people. That's me answering what about the roads for the 18th time <laughs> that day? Yeah, and you if you want to do uh, get that a lot, <laughs> or I just do. Those type of I do. So I get the people, they come up and they go, Spike, you know, I hate taxes as much as the next guy. And I'm like, okay, you're going to ask me about the roads, are you? You're, you think that you're going to show up and you figured out in the, I mean, at the absolute peak of the Dunning Kruger scale, you have determined something that no libertarian thought of before you did, before you spent 12 seconds thinking about it. Like you're going to drop the go, bike and walk off stage. You'd be like, I need to rethink the, my whole life. Oh, the road. This was me realizing that we never considered the roads. What the hell are we going to do without roads? So anyway, come on out and see me. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions you have. I'd love to get to meet you, take selfies, autographs, all that fun stuff. SpikeCohen.com, SpikeCohen.com slash first. Everything changes this summer. Trisha, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks so much, Spike. Thank you all for listening. Again, we'll put some of that stuff in the show notes for you. I would uh, encourage you all to go see Spike. I've seen him uh, speak in person. He's a great libertarian speaker. I mean, sometimes you can go and um, as much as I love everybody that works in the party or just for the movement, he's really uh, somebody that's inspiring and energizing. So thank you. definitely check him out. I will close out like I always do. I wish you peace, grace, love, and fuck the state. <laughs>